We are way too ne much negative in our world today. I want to hear about the glad reaper. Okay, next slide right here. In John chapter 4, verse 35, Jesus tells us about um, the glad reaper. Here it is in John 4, verse 35. Can you see it on the screen there? Oh, it's coming. I'm sure it's coming here. John 4, 35. All right, here we go. Let's read it together. One, two, three, go. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes in Portsmouth and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. We've got to open our eyes in this town, don't we? Maybe your eyes are already open, but there are all around us ripe fruit. Now, I know there's a lot of people going around saying today that there is uh, nobody's interested in the gospel. But that's not true. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, open your eyes. The fields are ripe for the harvest. Amen? It was Mark Finley that said once that he says that he believes in every single city there are at least 5% that would become a Seventh-day Adventist today if somebody invited them. 5%. That's quite a bit if you have a large city that you're in. A lot of people. There's a lot of people that are ripe. Open our eyes. The fields are ripe for the harvest. How many of you have ever lived near an orchard before? What happens when the fruit gets really ripe? What's the danger when the fruit gets really ripe? It will fall and rot, right? Everybody say after me, ripe will rot if it's not reaped. So this is why Jesus is saying, open your eyes. The fields are ripe. We need to move quickly. The fields are ripe. People are, people are going through things right now and need to hear the good news of Jesus. Some of you know that uh, my mother just passed away recently. It was a pretty difficult time. But I want to say something wonderful about Jesus. He gave her incredible hope going through that time. Don't you think people in this community deserve to have that same hope? The power of Christ going with them, the promise of the resurrection, the promise of the second coming, even the healing of Jesus. How many of you believe in healing today? We talked about that today and the power of Christ to heal. So let's find out the glad reaper. Let's go to the next slide. Here we go. Here's the glad reaper. Here it is. John 4, verse, 4, verse uh, 36. Are you ready? Is it up there yet? Uh, here we go. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Even now, the one who reaps draws wage and the harvest a crop for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may be what? Glad. glad together. There you have the glad reaper. Amen? There it is right there. God is calling us to be glad reapers in these days. I, I'm, isn't that wonderful? The problem is we have way too many grim reapers. <laughs> You know what, if you're, if, if, when you get done hearing a message, you feel grim, you probably didn't hear the gospel. Because the gospel is a glad thing. It brings gladness, right? Yes, it definitely convicts us of our sins. We see our, we see our, our shortcomings and we see our falling. But it drives us to the cross where we find forgiveness and restoration in Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, you know, that's one thing that I love about the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Let's go to the next slide here. You know, um, it's, there's two slides. We'll go to the next uh, two slides uh, right there. Let's go to the one right after that. Really powerful right here. Okay, you know, we have been giving an incredible message of Seventh-day Adventists. I want to say this really clearly. Seventh-day Adventists are not better than other Christians. We're not better than the Baptists. We're not better than the Methodists. We're not better than the Catholics. We can go on and on and on. We're not better. But let me be very clear. The Seventh-day Adventist Church may not be better than other denominations, but we've been given a greater responsibility. Don't ever forget that. We're not just one denomination among what? 30,000 denominations in the world? There's about 30,000 Christian denominations in the world. Are we just another denomination out there? Or does God have a specific purpose for us? Do we have a greater responsibility? I believe we do. God has given us the very last message of hope and warning to the world before he comes back. God has called this church, you and I, to be glad reapers in the last days. Let's read this together. If you don't believe me, here it is right here. One, two, three, go. In a special sense, seven of the Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning to a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals. Think about that for a minute. The most solemn truths ever trusted to mortals. You know, the message we've been given is more solemn than the message given to Jonah. The message given to us is more solemn than the message given to Noah. The message given to us is more solemn than the message given to John the Baptist. It goes on, entrusted to mortals, have been given to us to proclaim to who? To the world. The proclamation of these truths is to be our work. The world is to be warned and God's people are to be true to the trust committed to them. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're a glad reaper.
I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Jonathan Isaac. Here's a picture of him for you on the screen here. Jonathan Isaac. Um, have you heard of Jonathan Isaac for, for uh, plays on the, what team does he play on? Yeah, the magic, that's right. He said something really powerful. He said this, I cannot think of a better antidote for the times we see other than the gospel. Isn't it wonderful to see a young person saying that? This young man is looking around. He's going, you know, for all the craziness that's happening in our world, there's only one antidote. It's the gospel of Jesus. Amen. Telling people the incredible news of Jesus is what will bring this world together and save people who are lost. Bring them together. Well, look at this next slide right here. Here's, here's a quote from Spirit of Prophecy. I don't know who got, I think they all got it from, the, I think they both got it from the same place. Jesus, don't you think? Listen to what she writes in Ministry of Healing, page 141. Let's read it together. One, two, three, go. The giving of the gospel to the world is the work that God has committed to those who bear his name. For earth's sin and misery, the gospel is the only antidote to make known to all mankind the message of the grace of God is the first work of those who know its healing power. What is the only antidote? The gospel. Can you see how special it is that we're glad reapers? We get to share with people the only antidote for the problems in the world today, and I think it's wonderful. And you say, well, how is the gospel? Well, you know, let's go to the next slide here. The gospel centers at the cross of Jesus. You know, there are some words that we don't hear very much today. We don't hear much about forgiveness, do we? That's not popular in our world today. We're being told to hate each other, basically. Have you seen the division that's happening? And we're not being taught uh, anything about reconciliation, that we can actually come together as brothers and sisters, regardless of your race or your creed or your nationality. We're not hearing that anymore. We're not hearing about restoration. Everybody's on an endless treadmill of having to pay back for whatever else they've done. Forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration is disappeared from the common dialect today. But not at the cross. At the cross, we learn that we can be forgiven for our sins. At the cross, we realize that we can be reconciled to God. Isn't that beautiful? At the cross, we realize that we can be restored to a right relationship with God. At the cross, we receive righteousness. Amen? At the cross, we receive assurance of salvation. At the cross, we receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus living inside. At the cross, we find new life and purpose. Can you see how wonderful it is to be a glad reaper? I want to say to you today that there may be some here in this room right now that desperately need to go to the cross. You've been going to everybody else. You've been going to Fox News. You've been going to CNN. How about just shut the TV off? How about take a few moments, maybe an hour, and just contemplate what took place for you on the cross? Do you realize that from the side of Jesus flowed water and blood? Those are the two things we desperately need. Blood to wash away our sins and water, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, to empower us to live for God. What if you just stood under the fountain of his flow, the flow of the blood of Christ, the flow of the water of the Holy Spirit, and you have your sins all washed away? You can do that. Jesus says, come unto me, all you who labor and have you laid, and I will give you rest. You know, many times we're trying to clean up our lives first before we come to Jesus. Here's the thing, that'll never happen. It's only Jesus that can clean you up. But if we go to the cross, this is, you're hearing Glad Reaper stuff. Is this exciting? Yes. I don't know what you've done in your life, what you've been through, the guilt that you're carrying right now, the condemnation, the heavy load that you're carrying for years and years. What are you doing under there? Why don't you bring it to the cross and put it on Christ? Amen. Let him carry your burdens. Find forgiveness at the cross. At the cross, you can be made right with God again, fresh and new, right now. Your relationship with God can be restored right now. Just by going to Jesus and saying, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me on Calvary's cross. I receive your blood to wash away my sins. I receive the water of your Holy Spirit to empower me to live for you. I want your righteousness. Right there. Very interesting. Mel Gibson understood this in the movie The Passion. When he was driving those nails, those, you remember the scene where the nails were going into the hands of Jesus? It was Mel Gibson's hand holding the, <laughs> holding the hammer. Because he, he, he realized that we nailed Jesus there. You're not better than anybody else. We all killed the Son of God. He died because of our sins. But brothers and sisters, if we go to Jesus right now, just like with the Roman soldiers, he'll wrap his robe of righteousness around us. A robe without seam, without sin, perfect from top to bottom. The Bible tells us his robe was without seam. It was from top to bottom. Jesus came from heaven to earth without sin. And he covers us in his righteousness when we go to the cross. The thing that stands in the way is our pride. But if we come to Christ, Jesus handles that. Amen? Amen. You know, it's interesting. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, let's go to the next slide here. The Seventh-day Adventist Church really believed that we were glad reapers. Did you know that? 
We believe so strongly that our message needed to go out into the whole world. Did you know this? This is fascinating, and I don't want to freak you out, but this is just the facts of history. Did you know that Seventh-day Adventists did not place paid pastors over local churches or districts? Instead, they placed pastors over territories. Got awful quiet in here. Why is that? The pastor's role was to find ripe fruit in every town and city and gather them together into a church, train them in ministry, and appoint elders to pastor them. That's why we were the fastest growing denomination in the world. We really believed we were glad reapers. But now I think we were confused. We think we're grim reapers. But we're glad reapers. We must go quickly. We put pastors over territories, and they would learn, work with the local churches, and the local churches were pastored by guess who? The elders were the pastors of the local churches. The paid ministers were hired to get out there quickly, work with the local churches, work with the members, but go out there quickly and reach the right fruit before it what? Rots. And like Paul, the pastor would then move on to the next town or city and repeat his work of personal and public evangelism there, working along with the local churches that were there as well. Pastors weren't alone, they were working with the churches, but they were reaching the territories, and quickly the work was going forward. Why? Because we believe that people needed to hear the wonderful news of the cross. Amen? They need to hear the message of the cross. They need to realize what Jesus is offering us there. My brothers and sisters, I can't emphasize this enough. What is delaying you from coming to the cross? You trying to clean things up in your life first? It'll never happen. Go to him as you are. Let him take off those filthy rags and put his seamless robe over you. Let him wash away your sins in his blood. Let him fill you with the Holy Spirit, the water of the Holy Spirit, empower you. This is the heart of the three angels' messages, the everlasting gospel. Amen? You know, a lot of people get confused on the three angels' messages. I, I think the three angels' message is very simple. I think, you can, I think you can share the three angels' message in two minutes. The first angels' message is Jesus, the everlasting gospel. Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. The second angel's message is his word. Because Babylon is confusion, and we're called out of confusion into the clarity of his word. Amen? And the third angel's message is his church. Here are they which keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen? So the first angel's message is Jesus, our only Savior. The second angel's message is his word. So we have clarity in a confused world. And the third angel's message is his church, his people, who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Amen? You know, I'll never forget uh, some years ago when my daughter was eight years old. She's now married and she's 24, so it was a long time ago. But she'll always be eight in my mind. Dads, you understand? Okay, they're all little girls no matter what. But I'll, I'll never forget um, uh, one day um, she was playing with her friends from the town that we were living in. And when she was born, she had this little birthmark on the side of her face, a little birthmark. And when I held her in my arms, I looked at that birthmark and I kissed it and I whispered in her ear, that's daddy's kiss spot. So she always knew, whenever I saw her, even now when she comes for Christmas here, I'm going to grab her by the, her face and I'm going to turn around and kiss that little spot. It's what? It's daddy's kiss spot. Hello. And she knows that, right? Well, when she was eight years old, this little boy looked at her one day and she, he goes, and a bunch of kids were around her and she, he goes, that's the ugliest looking birthmark I've ever seen. It's so ugly. Now I was listening to this. And that's the first time in my life I almost got in a fight with an eight-year-old. <laughs> Just held off. Just joking. I wouldn't fight with you. <laughs> Just to be clear. Right? But I was like, what? I was ready to jump in there and go after that poor little guy. But I stopped and listened to see what she would say. She turned to him. The hands on her hips. She goes, that's not how we birth Mark. That's my daddy's kiss. My daddy's kiss. <laughs> You know, we've got to stop being ashamed to be in Seventh-day Adventist. We've got a special message. We're not better, but we have a greater responsibility. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus, and God has given us incredible truth that other people need to know. By the way, these messages that we've been given, you're not saved by these messages, but guess what? It might save people from being lost. We calling people to the safeguard of God's word in these last days, the clarity of God's word, the second angel's message. People need to know the truth. God gave us the truth for a reason. I hear people making fun of the Seventh Heaven's message all the time. All these fundamentals, they get after the fundamentals. I'm glad this church is not like that. Amen? Amen. But there are people that mock the, the doctrines of the Seventh Heaven's Adventist church. And I'm like, why are you doing that? They're not our messages. They're God's messages. Amen. Obviously, if he was giving it to us, it's for a reason. Usually because he loves us. 
always because he loves us. Amen? So, what a blessing that we have. We have our Father's kiss spot. We're not better, but we've been called for a specific message to preach the first, second, and third angel's messages. Amen. Um, <clears throat> so I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> that means I've got to wind this down, don't I? Um, look at this next slide right here. How many of you like little lambs? I know you guys. I'm at a church that loves animals, so that's a cute little lamb, isn't he? <laughs> uh, did you know that in Australia, there's a special place where they have 2,000 lambs? Uh, they might have more. It might ask, uh, be different a number, but about 2,000 uh, little sheep. And these sheep are absolutely perfect. They have no... Uh, diseases or anything in them, no, no problems with their bones or whatever else. They're just absolutely perfect DNA, right? And what they do is they inject these little lambs with rattlesnake venom. Now, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? But it doesn't hurt them. Instead, what they do is they produce antibodies against the venom. And then guess what this, these people do? They sell the serum from these little lambs to other people who might have gotten bitten by rattlesnakes and they're healed by the, by the antibodies from these little lambs. Is that, is that beautiful? What? How many of you can hear the gospel in this? Isn't he the spotless lamb of God without sin? Amen? Nothing at all? Isn't it true that, that the devil tried to kill Jesus on Calvary, but yet Jesus, through his blood, heals us? It's such a wonderful... Uh, the gospel is everywhere you look. Amen? We're, such, we're so blessed to be uh, in these last days to be part of a movement, that, a movement of glad reapers. Uh, that we warn people, but we warn them so that they might go to the cross, and then they might be glad. Because <laughs> at the cross, there's salvation, and there's forgiveness, and restoration, and new life. You know, um, we've been talking about a strategy uh, for the conference on how do we get our message out into our world. And I want to share with you um, a, a simple little strategy. And I, I want you to say challenge. Everybody say challenge. This is a Glad Reaper challenge. It's not the Glad Reaper command. We don't do stuff like that at the conference office. You can choose to be a part of it or not. It's your business. Or maybe you modify it or whatever else. But let me just share with you our vision. But before I do that, I love this quote by George S. Patton. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan next week. <laughs> it's pretty smart, isn't it? Uh, oftentimes we try to come up with a perfect plan out the gate, and we never do it. So then we never act. It's better to have a good plan, uh, a good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan next week. So here's our good plan violently executed now. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here it is. All right. So here's what we're challenging throughout the, the conference right now, and hopefully Portsmouth would see the value in this as well. Um, but we want, uh, we have a little simple, simple acronym for our Glad Reaper Challenge. It's TELL. Everybody say TELL. Does that make sense, TELL? Because we're called a tell the three angels messages okay so t-e-l-l -L. so here it is it's just four four um four actions we're, we're encouraging every church around the conference to participate in number one we believe that every member in the seventh day Adventist church is a minister and they have a right to be trained for personal and public evangelism you have a right for a long time we've taken away the ministry from the laity it's a mistake huge huge mistake we want to restore the ministry to the laity don't you think it's better to have not just one minister up here on the stage, but every member a minister? Well, that's exactly what Jesus died to do. At the cross, Christ made us a priesthood, right? A priesthood of all believers. So the first thing we're, we're challenging every church to do is to train their members in personal and public evangelism. Make sure every member has a chance to know how to lead someone to Jesus. What do you think about that? Uh, here's some ways we want to do that. We have something called Connect Academy. It's online. You never have to leave your home. It's, it's twice a year. And it's usually for about, uh, about three or four weeks where we train in personal and public evangelism online where you can learn how to, to be trained. That's called Connect Academy. we got two of them coming up next year. We also have Regenerate. Regenerate is a training program that goes around the conferences. So it'll be in different areas in the conference where you can go in person and get training. And we're also asking every church to do their own training, too. Some of you guys have better ideas. And if you do, share them with us so we can look better, okay? But uh, we, we're challenging every local church. Um, to train. Second thing is, we want to encourage every member to participate in Fill the Baptistry Sabbaths. April 13 and October 5th of next year, every church in Northern New England is filling their baptismal tank. And guess what's going to happen? Our members are going to bring the people they've been studying with and leading to Jesus to that church to be baptized on those days. Now you might be saying, well, what if we want to baptize another? Does it have to be April 13, October 5? 
How many of you know for, you can baptize somebody every single Sabbath of the year? Amen? But what we're trying to do, what, the plan here is that we're wanting to give two special days to the laity, for them who are ministers, to bring someone they've given a Bible study, led to Christ, somebody they've led to Jesus. You know, Pat, the, the Apostle Paul says, he talked about being addicted to the, to the ministry. When you lead someone to Jesus, I promise you, you'll be addicted. It's the most exciting thing in the world to see someone come to Christ. And we want to give two days, April 13th and October 5, as a special time for the, for the saints, of God, for the God's ministers in the church, to bring people they've studied with to church on Sabbath. And here's the catch. If nobody's ready for baptism on those dates, you fill the baptistry tank anyway. Just in case. Yeah, just in case. But also what we're encouraging the church to do is to gather around the baptismal tank and say, Lord, by faith, we believe that you're going to bring people to our church. And we're, 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 going to, we're going to be praying in faith. I can't tell you how many pastors have come to me and, who have filled their baptismal tank on Filled the Baptist Sabbath with no baptisms who had baptisms the next time. Because God will honor us as we, as we move forward in faith in him. And people need the Lord. Everybody say, people need the Lord. And Seventh-day Adventists are what kind of reapers? Glad. Glad reapers. Thirdly, we want to challenge every church to lead at least one evangelistic meeting per year after camp meeting whether it's in the fall or in the spring of the next year. But we want every church to at least, don't you think people in our community have a right to hear our message? I think they do. We're not better, like I said, but we have a greater responsibility, and they have a right to hear the first, second, and third angel's message. They have a right. And we want to challenge at least once a year. You could do it. You guys already do this. I know that because you guys have excellent leadership. Uh, Pastor Jefferson and, and your elders are outstanding. You, you guys are already doing this. But just a challenge to do one a year holding meetings. And it doesn't have to be the pastor doing it. The members are ministers as well. Amen? You may not be a public preacher, but you could be on a team that presents the message, right? And somebody in the church can, can hold the message. By the way, young people are some of the best. Some of the best in the world are young people. And you've got a lot of young people in here. Amen? And then finally, we don't want to just be God's mouthpiece. We also want to love our communities through outreach ministries based on felt needs. So we want to figure out what are the needs in our community, and we want to minister to those needs. Amen? And that, that is really, really, really important, isn't it? Well, you know, um, I wanted to take a little time just to kind of talk to you guys a little bit, kind of have like a little town hall meeting. Would that be okay with you all? I want to hear what you love about your church and what you're excited about. Um, but I want to leave you with a story. Can I tell you a story real quick? Um, I think I'll stop my slides here, and then we'll go down to slide number uh, 20, uh, 24, if that's okay, number 24. But um, many years ago, uh, a husband, a, a father and his son, they loved to collect paintings. That was their thing to do, collect paintings. They, Rembrandt and Monet and some of the famous ones, they loved to collect them. Very wealthy family, and they would gather all kinds of beautiful paintings and stuff. Well, one day, um, the war came, and the son decided he would go to war, and he would fight for his country. So he said goodbye to his father, and he left. And tragically, the young boy, who was so close to his father, they were into collecting all these paintings, uh, was killed in battle. He was killed while actually saving another soldier. It's a true story. While, while he was saving the other soldier, he was shot and killed. The other soldier survived. The father was incredibly grieved, like any father would be, and, and struggled terribly with the loss he felt. But one day he heard a knock on the door. And he went to the door, and guess who was standing there? The young man that was saved by his son. And the young man was holding a painting in his hand. And he said, you know, I, kn I knew your son very well, and your son saved my life. And he goes, I know you love paintings too, and I'm not an excellent drawer, a uh, painter, but I, here's a painting of your son. And he turned it around, there was a painting of his son. The father almost fell, on, fell to the ground. Because he, saw, he said, you captured his eyes perfectly. And he loved the painting. And all the others kind of faded into the horizon compared to this one painting. He put the painting right in the middle in the, in the living room. And he could see his son uh, day in and day out. Well, eventually the father passed away. And the entire state went up for sale. And all the Rembrandts and Monets and all the things that he had in there were, were going to be auctioned off. And people came from around the world. This guy had quite a collection. People came all around the world for the sale. So they all gathered outside, and all the paintings were there, lined up, and everything was there. And there was guards watching over the paintings and everything. Lots of very high-profile people there. It was a big day. 
and the auctioneer got up there with his gavel, got ready to start the auction. He goes, all right, we're going to start with the first painting. First painting is this one. And he held up the painting of what? Of the sun. And he goes, we got, we got to sell this one first before we go off into any of the others. And everybody's like, come on. What is that? That's some terrible painting. We don't want that. We came here for the Rembrandts and the Monet's. Let's skip that and go to the others. And the auctioneer said, I got to start with this one. We're going to start with this one. What are you going to get for it? Who wants to buy this? No, nobody wanted it. And they actually started to whine about it. They said, come on. We came a long ways. Let's get going with the good stuff. Put that at the end or something. I don't care. Just don't put it up at the front. We don't want that. We want the others. And they started to get a little upset with the auctioneer. Finally, the gardener, the gardener who happened to be there, <laughs> some of you know where this is going, the gardener who happened to be there, he raised his hand on the back and he says, listen, I got $10 on me. I'll buy it. I love it. I love the sun. I'll, I'll buy it. And the auctioneer says, okay, uh, anybody want to get more than $10? Nobody did. They wanted to get that painting out of there, of the sun. So sure enough, they sold the painting for $10. And the gardener took the painting. And then they said, all right, let's get going. Let's get going. Let's get on with the sale. And the auctioneer put the gavel down and said, the auction's over. He said, I just want you to know before the man passed, the father passed away, he told me, he told me very clearly, he goes, you need to sell this first. And whoever buys the sun gets everything else. If you have Jesus, you got everything. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Brothers, what people need is Jesus. Whether you're preaching the Sabbath message, the state of the dead message, the health message, whether you're stewardship, spiritual gifts, second coming, mark of the beast, Jesus is what people need. Desperately need Jesus. And if you get Jesus, you got everything else. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, what a wonderful church, wonderful, wonderful message you've given us. We're so thankful that you've called us to be glad reapers, not grim reapers. When people see us coming, they should get excited. These people have a good message to encourage us, challenge us. Father, our message is Christ. First angel's message, Jesus. Second angel's message is his word. Third angel's message is his church. It's all about you, Jesus. We thank you, God, because we have the Son. So everything you are, we are. We're your sons and daughters. And everything he has, we have. What a blessing. That's good news. That's why we're glad reapers. And we thank you, Jesus. In your wonderful name, amen. amen. Well, brothers and sisters, let me just take a few minutes with you. And I guess we'll call this a town hall kind of a meeting.